Hi, welcome back to my channel, Manga Hoarder. My name is Laura, and today I'm talking to you about Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Um, but mostly I'm going to be talking about Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. This is the manga classic. Um, so I did uh, recently read Pride and Prejudice for a read-along that was happening on Booktube in March, I think. Um, but uh, shortly after finishing that, I also ended up reading this uh, manga classic. Um, and uh, this is sort of the adaptation of the novel. And there are quite a few in this particular series, so I think I had read one once before in the series, didn't particularly care for it, but I hadn't read it associated with uh, the novel, and so I thought that would be a good opportunity to talk about what the series looks like. So I think quite a few people are going to already be familiar with Pride and Prejudice. Even if you haven't read it, I think that uh, some of the points, some of the plot points, some of the character names will probably be familiar to you. Um, like uh, Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy are both uh, mentioned often in movies and TV. Um, just because this is such a part of our literary canon, it is um, basically the starting point uh, that many of modern romances point back to. Um, so it is, it is very influential, um, but it also is such a popular favorite. It continues to be a popular, hyped up favorite of so many different readers. Um, I can genuinely say that I love Jane Austen's novels. This is not my favorite of hers. This is my number four favorite. Um, I really love this novel, but it's still only number four. And uh, before that, I love uh, Northanger Abbey the absolute most. I love that novel so much. I've read it a number of times. Um, it is definitely more rough. It definitely has less plot um, or less sort of developed plot, um, but it is because it's so rough you really do see more of Jane Austen's character and biting wit and humor in that novel because she is less able to kind of seamlessly hide it in her novel. Um, I love Persuasion, that's her last, her final novel, and I love how of a mature work it is, not just because the characters themselves are quite a bit more mature than her other novels. It just, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful novel. And the other one I love, of course, is her other less popular title, which is Mansfield Park. And I think that one in particular, Fanny Price, who's the heroine of that story, um, gets a bad rap for being, um, uh, for not being proactive in her situation. Um, you know, she is a high moral character in that novel, um, and she is, uh, I think she's a hero or a heroine in the, the truest sense, except for the fact that she is, um, she is quietly steadfast in her beliefs. And I, I really, really, truly love it. So number four is uh, my favorite of the three most popular novels. And um, it still is one of the best things that I've read. I truly love it. And I think everyone should read it, um, or at least experience the story. And that's sort of where uh, this comes in, which is the manga classics adaptation. Now, I do have many problems with this. Um, and I'm going to talk about them, um, but I don't want you to think that just because I have a lot of problems that means that it's not of value or worthwhile to certain types of readers. It's just very not of value or worthwhile to me as a reader. Um, and I will talk to you a little bit about what that means. So without really going into the plot of Pride and Prejudice at all, I would rather um, because I sort of just expect that everybody knows what that story is already, um, and I will talk sort of spoilery about it in this review, um, but I also would recommend that if you really want to know what the plot of the story is, and you have um, really kind of no interest in reading the novel, then probably your first line of defense is either to watch the movie or to read the adaptation. Now, I don't think that this adaptation is bad, but I think that it fails in very many uh, respects. Um, as a, a fan of Jane Austen, I don't think it captures Pride and Prejudice 
at all except for as a summary of the story's major plot points. Um, there are a lot of convoluted things, people are traveling here and there, there's a lot of intrigue and uh, relationship developments uh, that you need to kind of put in the correct order in order for this story to work, and so all of those things are in here, but none of the other things that are in Pride and Prejudice are in here. None of the great character development, none of the great relationships that you've got between family members, um, none of the um, none of the great humor and the struggle of class and the uh, commentary on social norms or the biting wit of Jane Austen is in here and uh, in my opinion as an Austen fan this is a failure on that point but if you just need an introduction to the story of Pride and Prejudice without an introduction to Jane Austen because I think that this is devoid of Jane Austen then you could read this and enjoy the story. But I think that this is just a bridge to get you into reading Pride and Prejudice or you know, looking further into what Jane Austen might have for you. Um, I don't think this is the last place that you should stop because this isn't going to give you much um, of the Pride and Prejudice story, at least the parts of it that I love. Um, at the same time, um, because I am a huge fan of manga, I'm a major manga reader, um, that's pretty much how I spend most of my free time and all of my free finances, um, this fails as manga as well. I think it is a very um, adequate graphic novel to tell the summary plot points of Pride and Prejudice, but as a manga, it fails to deliver. It is, uh, first and foremost, not manga. And I think that that will confuse most people because it is calling itself a manga classic. It is not manga. Um, it was uh, written, or story adapted by Stacey King. The art is by Po Tsi. It is written in the uh, Japanese language reading order. Um, which is right to left, and not the English reading order, which is left to right. Um, but it was never intended for a Japanese audience. It was never written in Japanese. It's not written by a Japanese author. So it's missing the key, uh, major key components of what makes this a manga. Manga is not defined by its style or its reading direction. It is defined by its intention and its authorship. Um, in my opinion, of course, you can always argue against me because it has not fully been defined, I think, in academia. At least not English language academia. I have read a lot about it. Um, or I've been looking for someone to perfect, perfectly define it for me and I haven't found uh, such a definition yet. But um, I will argue that this is not manga. It takes the reading language or reading direction from a Japanese language perspective, but it applies it to a title that was written in English originally, which makes absolutely no sense, except for that it is attempting to fool the reader into thinking that this is manga. And that is one of the major failures of this title, is that it actually feels like a lie. It already is trying to pretend to be something that it is not. Now, if I was just going to compare this against other graphic novels, I genuinely would think that this was a perfectly fine graphic novel. I wouldn't think it was superior, but I would think that it was a great mode of getting the story that you needed. But as a manga, because I have to compare it against other manga, it fails because it is, first and foremost, not manga. I can't, like, I cannot state that enough. I cannot compare it because it is, you know, comparing apples to oranges. Um, but it's trying to pretend it is, so if I compare it to it, um, there are some flaws that I see. Um, one of the major flaws that I uh, encounter in this title is that it is mixing a bunch of art styles. Now, manga oftentimes, particularly if there's a comedic element, may mix, um, art styles in a way, but they still fit within the same 
style that you can tell that it is the same hand drawing these characters. Um, in this case you've got uh, many different things going on so you have this very sketchy black and white pencil style drawing um, and then you have uh, Mr. Collins who is drawn he isn't even articulated with his hands although neither are um, Elizabeth Bennett um, but he is given a incredibly cartoonish very characterized or char uh, character caricaturized uh, version of what a manga character should be because he is a foolish character. He is often portrayed as um, a cartoon or more cartoony than everybody else except for uh, the mother, Mrs. Bennett. So Elizabeth Bennett, who is the heroine, is always kind of drawn in this same kind of um, cutesy uh, manga style. Mr. Collins is always drawn in this characterized uh, style. And so, you know, even though they are both styles that look like manga, they don't, in my opinion, fit together on the page and they don't make sense. Um, there's a couple of other spots that uh, particularly bothered me. Um, page... Page 16 was troublesome. Um, uh, from an artistic perspective, um, we have this page here. It's just sort of a number of uh, scenes in these long uh, vertical bands. Um, but you can see here that Mr. Bennett, who is the father of the, the daughters, um, he is in this band here, and then their estate is here. Um, but when you look at the estate, uh, the perspective uh, has this line here that kind of joins up with his head and it kind of becomes part of his body. And so the drawing themselves just don't make sense. Um, they cause you to think, hey, he's actually part of the estate himself. And I think that that's more of an artistical, artistical, uh, more of an artistic error and less of a metaphor of him being the estate itself, which could have been the intention, but I know that in this case it is definitely not. Um, I will also complain a bit about um, this panel here, and this is uh, just an example of some of the artwork that you'll see. There's these extreme um, uh, perspective uh, drawings, but you can see that they are all very um, mathematically drawn. There is no life in them. There's no dynamism in them. Um, one of the great things about manga is that they have a cultural understanding of dynamic illustration, of things that should be actioning off of a panel um, so that you always see a great deal of movement. Um, even in your uh, typical buildings where, where there is action, um, even in your typical buildings where there is no technical action, you should feel a level of dynamic uh, movement or dynamic depth. Um, here, everything is mechanically drawn, um, probably uh, digitally rendered. There is no um, atmospheric depth. There is no shading to indicate any sort of light and dark space. It's um, many times throughout this, it's, it's just a lifeless formless illustration, which belonged more, I would say, in uh, architectural drawings than in a manga where you're trying to express mood and emotion and feelings and story. Um, so, you know, even just from like the basics of illustrative design, this is a problematic title. I have many, many more complaints and I've, I don't really want to go into every single thing that I think is wrong with this because I didn't rate it very well. Um, I will talk a little bit about my uh, its relationship to Jane Austen. Now when I think about manga, um, when I think about manga and when I think about novels and how I relate them to novels, I think that, um, you know, if you have about a 14 volume series, um, the way that the stories are written in manga is they generally cover a long arc. Um, every single volume of manga is, in effect, a chapter of that novel. Um, in this case, you've got um, a manga that's about the size of two novels. It's about an omnibus size, and it looks to be just about as thick as the actual novel. In my opinion, what they have attempted to do is condense 
the novel into about two chapters worth of text, um, two chapters worth of story, and so you lose a great deal of what makes this story good um, because you had to get rid of most of it. There's a number of things in this manga that I, of course, object to as far as a fan of Jane Austen, um, probably more so than I would even uh, object to as it tries to become manga. Um, there's just a number of times where I felt it was completely uncharacteristic, particularly of the characters, to do the things that they do. Um, this is basically the story of five daughters, three of whom are the most important, the eldest Jane, the second Elizabeth, and the youngest uh, Lydia. And then there are three young single gentlemen who have moved into the neighborhood. Mr. Bingley, who is taking a house in the uh, nearby, like in the neighborhood, uh, Mr. Darcy, who is his best friend and accompanying him, and Mr. Wickham, who happens to be a militia, who is also sort of staying in the neighboring town, or is staying kind of more in town. Um, and they're sort of, these girls are sort of in a position where their father, um, his estate is to be entailed to the next near, uh, next living uh, male heir. And of course, since he has no sons, that means it has to go to a Mr. Collins. And so these girls are not only not able to um, earn their fortune, they have to uh, guarantee their uh, they have to guarantee their future by marrying well. And so this is a story basically about uh, that kind of that fact. Um, and so these three girls in particular, and these three young men, of course, they all end up getting paired off. Um, in this story, uh, there is a very particular uh, characteristic way that each of these girls act. Um, in it, um, uh, at the beginning, Elizabeth is sort of attached or becomes friendly with Mr. Wickham, who is the, the military man. He is uh, not a good person. He has, well, to be under understated, and uh, he has been spreading rumors about Mr. Darcy, who he knew growing up. And so she has sort of an affi uh, affinity for Mr. Wickham because he seems so uh, casual and good natured, and he has had this tough past that he claims to have had. And that's also why she is so. Uh, upset with Mr. Darcy is because she believes Mr. Wickham, because Mr. Darcy's actions and attitude has always shown him to be a very proud and disagreeable sort of man. Um, and so um, in the book, you know, she is quite friendly with Mr. Wickham and they see each other um, often at, at, uh, at uh, different um, assemblies or parties um, and talk about things and you know they're obviously quite friendly and she may or may not have hope in that regard that he might you know return her feelings but it is never explicitly stated that she has feelings for him just that she he might have been a favorite of hers um, and in here uh, when she rejects Mr. Collins' advances uh, when he offers marriage to her and rejects him Jane kind of comforts her, the oldest daughter comforts her and says, um, don't worry, you know, mother will be totally fine with your decision once Mr. Wickham proposes. There's no way that she would ever have said that in the book. Jane herself is known for being a very solid uh, character, very good character, and not a silly character. And the statement that uh, she would, um, expressly state this hoped uh, finale in such a way would never have happened. It is a very silly statement to make uh, to Elizabeth. Elizabeth herself is also known for being a fairly stable character. Um, she is her father's favorite because she has wit and she is intelligent. This is not the statement, at least in uh, this novel, this statement does not make sense. Um, there is another sort of series of statements that really irked me. Uh, when Mr. Collins is introduced, Mr. Collins is uh, their cousin who is uh, set to inherit their estate when the father passes away. He's a clergyman and he is under the um, patronage of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, um, who happens to be the aunt of Mr. Darcy. Um, he his entire world revolves around Lady Catherine de Bourgh. She is his everything, his center, um, and his reason for all of his pride and purpose. And um, 
in this when he brings her up, which is hardly at all, which is, in my opinion, very uncharacteristic, but when he brings her up, he just calls her Catherine de Berg, without the reverence of calling her lady. There is no way that Mr. Collins would, would uh, dare to say something so casual about his patroness. It does not make sense. Um, there are other situations in here, you know, there's one bit where Jane is pining for the loss of Mr. Bingley and she's very upset and Elizabeth and their Aunt Gardner, uh, her Aunt Gardner, are talking about this and thinking how poorly of Jane and they're thinking of Jane uh, kind of floating there in her negligee. Like, why would they ever think that? They would never think about Jane in her negligee. Like, that would be considered incredibly off-color and rude. Uh, just, there's subtleties like that that just, every time I read it, <laughs> like every page, I was getting irritated. I was actually taking notes every time I was getting irritated, and I had to stop taking notes because I was taking more notes than I was reading, because I was irritated all the time, consistently through this book. It does not capture Jane Austen. It captures the story of Pride and Prejudice, but it does not capture Jane Austen, and I think that's sort of a big uh, distinction and a big problem that I personally have with this book. It is perfectly adequate at telling the story. You know, here's the plot, this is what they do, these are the people they met, and that's it. But there's no growth and development, there's no uh, relationship. She doesn't have a... Uh, Elizabeth does not have a relationship with her father in this. You know, she's her father's favorite. It is, uh, it's a total surprise to me that that would be just completely ignored and forgotten. Um, so yeah, you know, some of the costuming was a little bit, um, extreme, but I kind of forgave it because it was trying to take a style, trying to stylize things to a manga, uh, style, but, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, as someone who is not a casual reader of manga, um, this is a failure. As someone who is not a casual reader of Jane Austen, this was a failure. But if you are not, or if you are a casual reader in either of those respects, or I mean in both, um, then this might work for you. Uh, I do have friends I know that really like these uh, book to comic adaptations. They like to read the comic adaptation more than they like reading the book. I think it's sort of a nice quick way of getting the story without having to uh, spend a lot of time at it, and maybe that would be a good entry point for you. But for me, this was just... Uh, it was just a cringe fest. Every single page caused me to cringe. There are many notes where I have, um, I'm just down here at my feet, where I just put a page number and just cringe. <laughs> so it was, it was an awkward read. So personally, I would recommend going with actual Jane Austen and read Pride and Prejudice. And personally, if you know this was a little bit too daunting to you, or you were a little too concerned about um, picking up a classic, I would recommend actually watching uh, one of the TV or movie adaptations. I would even allow you to watch the Kira Knightley adaptation, which I think is absolute garbage, but it is still better garbage than this particular comic. Sad to say. Um, the 2005 Colin Firth Jennifer L adaptation is definitely the best one. I have watched it probably 50 times and that is not it, uh, you know, exaggeration. Maybe more times than that. I have watched it several times in German, which I do not speak. I have also watched it in Japanese, uh, which is an experience. Um, it is definitely the best adaptation. If you are already a Jane Austen fan or a Pride and Prejudice fan, if you've already watched all the adaptations, the one that you are missing is the Laurence Olivier and um, Greer Garson adaptation. The, uh, the film, the dialogue, was all written by Aldous Huxley, who's the author of Brave New World. He takes a whole lot of liberties. It's a whole lot of fun. You should definitely go and check it out if this is not your first time into Jane Austen. That was my first introduction when I was a small child. I loved that movie. I still do. Um, but yeah, uh, Jane Austen is one of my faves. 
and uh, unfortunately despite it being trying to be manga that was not one of my faves um, and I definitely will not be collecting it not intentionally anyway um, won't be collecting it I think we do have one in that edition which or in that manga classic series um, maybe Sense and Sensibility. So anyway, I kind of enjoyed uh, reading the manga. I prefer, of course, the novel and I would recommend that you check it out if it seems, if you have any inclination to doing so. Um, and, you know, if you need a bridge into reading classics, then go ahead and try the manga classics out. It might be a good bridge for you. I know that when I was in school, um, something that I like to do is I would either watch the movie or I would read um, or listen to an audiobook or read a summary of a novel before I would read it. You know, I, um, to get all the spoilers, to know who the characters are, to know what was going on, because sometimes novels are complicated. It's a lot easier to read them once you already know what's going to happen. And so I would do that often. So this is a good way to uh, do that, to read that, that manga classic, read it first, and then, um, you know, venture into reading the, the actual novel. It's not, you know, as far as classics go, it's one of the easier ones to read, in my opinion. Um, but then again, I have read it many, many times. So that's it. That's my sort of review of Pride and Prejudice. Um, let me know if you've read any of these other manga classics or if you've read this one in particular. And uh, do you like reading adaptations from novels um, in sort of comic books or graphic novel format? Let me know about that down below because I personally struggle with it as a as a concept, as a format. I have uh, very few sort of times have thought, hey, that was a great adaptation. Um, more than I would say the novel was. So I'm really curious about that. Let me know about that down below. Um, I think that's it for me today. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.